Aloha and welcome to Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Ted Kapalas, the Director of Strategic Campaigns for the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii, and I'll be standing in today for our regular host, Dr. Kelee Aquino. Today, we're going to be talking about how to clear a lot of the roadblocks to housing on Maui. Our guest is Todd Apo, Vice President of Community, Community Partnerships and Public Affairs at the Hawaii Community Foundation. Todd's been working on their initiative, House Maui, which aims to create a sustainable housing market for Maui's local families. So thank you so much for being with us today, Todd. Hey, aloha, glad to be here. And before we jump in, I was hoping you could give us a little bit of information on your background and, and how did you get involved with this whole uh, housing issue on Maui? Sure, um, you know, I started out as an attorney and um, then got into sort of real estate development and worked with the Colina Resort, uh, resort development side of things. But we also had residential product going in there. Um, spent some time with Disney at the Alani Resort and then was doing development down in Ward Village. Uh, but in the middle of that, spent six years on the Honolulu City Council. And so have been able to sort of get a look at some of these housing issues, both from the development side on the private sector, as well as the public sector side from the policy side. So when I joined White Community Foundation, about a year and a half ago, uh, the House Maui Initiative was getting itself started up and was able to jump in and, and sort of, I think, bring some perspective and thinking around it. Uh, as we move through as a community foundation into this sure. endeavor. That's great. And, and let's talk about that, that House Maui Initiative. Kind of what, what is it and, and why did you guys choose to focus on Maui? Yeah, so it really all started with the change framework that Hawaii Community Foundation has been working on for the past few years. And each letter of change is a different sector that we focus on within the community. And the C sector is uh, community and economics. And under there, we decided to focus on, we saw so many individuals and families facing here in Hawaii. And, you know, so as we looked at sort of the Alice report and where some of those numbers are and the issues for those that were we're working, but not being able to make enough to live here. Um, we started to identify the, the housing cost burden. That led us to look at Maui. You know, as we looked at the data, which we tried to do through the change framework, uh, the data was showing us that Maui was where the situation was the worst. You know, residents were being outbought by non-residents in the housing market. Um, the cost of those homes just continued to grow, go up. And we also were seeing there was a complete lack of the development of new supply. Right? And so when you you have an issue both on the demand and the supply side, it created a, obviously a really bad situation for Maui residents. And so that's really what led us to say, okay, our housing initiative is gonna start on Maui. In the end, you know, we're hoping that we can get to all the counties if we can create the right model, but, but that's where we started. And so the how's Maui and this whole initiative focuses around three pillars. And we say it's aligning resources, uh, empowering and engaging individuals and families, and then organizing and advocating. And the goal in each of those is one, to make sure that government resources and philanthropic resources are all directed collectively to have impact. Um, Educate and Empower is really about working with families. So we opened up a financial opportunity center so that families could get the counseling help from a financial standpoint, the career help, to be ready to either own or rent a home when those became available. And then an organized and engaged step that we're really working on next that you're seeing us start to be a little bit more visible in the public about is talking to policymakers, looking at what can, uh, can happen from a policy side. And I know some of the discussion we'll get into today about regulation that can help the whole housing market within, within the county. So that's really hopefully in a bit of a nutshell sort of where the, the House Maui initiative is and sort of how we're trying to lead through that. No, absolutely. And, and housing, you know, as you know, is, is a huge issue, especially coming up with the elections. I think everybody is talking about uh, the housing issue and, and what we can do to, to address that here in Hawaii. Uh, and so along those lines, you know, you, you touched on them briefly earlier, but just to kind of go a little bit more in depth, what do you think are, are really the main barriers to creating that house, housing, whether it's on Maui or, or Hawaii as a whole? Yeah, you know, in today's world, it, it's just about everything. I mean, that's what makes it so hard is um, everything from land costs, land availability, um, the price of, of goods and services, the, the you know, supply, line, ch supply chain line issues. Uh, but you also get into regulatory issues and what it takes to actually get land entitled to build 
and then getting through the permitting process to build itself. I mean, mm -hmm. it's every step along the way. And um, so that's why I say it makes it tough to think about how do we get to this overall solution that's going to get one more homes built and two, get people into them. But it also, you know, because there's so many different pieces, you can start sort of picking them off, right? And, and identifying those. And so there's been, as you mentioned, the elections is bringing up a lot of the discussion around this. Uh, the regulatory side and the regulatory burden that exists is I think an area where we're all, I think from the philanthropic side, from the homeowner side, from the, the policymaker side, trying to figure out what, what are the best ways we can fix that? How can we reduce the time and cost to get homes developed? And one thing that we've started talking about is building a home, the actual building it isn't that hard, uh, mm -hmm. but the system has made it hard. And so it's another piece that is, as we think about that statement, we start thinking about what are the systematic changes that we can be involved in and help make in order to improve the housing situation. So there's a lot of things that can deal with the symptoms, but until we get some systematic changes, we're, we're not gonna get to a long-term solution of housing uh, for Maui County or anywhere else. Right, and, and just to kind of piggyback on that, I, you know, I think I've seen studies in the past that from you hero that actually say Hawaii has some of the highest regulatory barriers in the country. Um, and so just looking at those regulations, um, are there any in particular that you think may be some of the biggest problems to, to our housing supply issue here? Yeah, you know, so when, we, when you step down into that regulatory piece of the puzzle, um, it, it's equally complex as you start to break it down. Um, you know, there's a reason for regulation. And so as we go through this, this process of looking at how to improve the situation, we have to recognize, um, we can't just sit there and say regulation is bad, right? And so it's a matter of, of taking it with, uh, tacking it with the scalpel as opposed to you know, the blunt hammer and figuring out what regulations do we need, but what are the ones that we can either eliminate or make more efficient? And you know, I think the counties are, are looking really hard at that. Um, obviously Honolulu's uh, DPP, has been in the news about how they're, they're working to improve their system. I know Hawaii County just instituted, I believe last year, a new computer system to help through that process. And so just that permitting process side, approval side, hope, the hope that technology can help some of that efficiency need is there. But I think more sure. to your question, right? There are some larger um, entitlement regulatory processes that can be duplicated at times, it can be slow at times, and those are the things that we really need to improve and you know, streamline with the recognition that this is to provide housing. And let's jump off on a little bit of a tangent, but you know, I think as we look at how, how much are we going to prioritize housing and how much are we gonna really place it ahead of other concerns that come up, right? When the new development's coming up, you hear the issues of, traffic and overcrowding and school capacity and those types of things. But if we let those things stop homes, especially the affordable housing developments, we're keeping families from having a place to live. And right. I think we need to provide that housing solution and make sure we're dealing with the other issues as much as we can, but we can't let those other issues basically trump allowing someone to have a home for themselves and their family. Sure. And a lot of that stems from the, you know, not in my backyard type of, of people. And, you know, luckily, the state legislature, we saw that the HB 1837, the yes in my backyard, uh, actually got through. And granted, it only creates a study and a working group for right now. But it's, I, you know, we think it's an important first step. And, and from the sounds of it, it sounds like uh, you, you feel a little similar to that. Um, you know, yeah. many projects you know, along the lines of what you were talking about earlier, it doesn't really take a, a long time to build a home. Um, it, it actually is a lot of the permitting and a, a lot of the regulatory aspects of it. Um, you know, a lot of these projects require multiple political approvals at the state and county level. Uh, like you said, it can be a little duplicative at times. Do, does this trip up good housing projects? And, and, you know, how can this process be made a little easier? Yeah, I, I, it definitely trips them up. You know, um, that statement that time is money is really true and developed. And, you know, I know it's hard to see to the general public of what those delay impacts are, um, but they can not only 
ultimately make the housing cost more, they at times cause the development not to move forward. The amount of pre-development work that goes into, as you mentioned, some of these duplicative state, county, local processes um, takes a lot of time. It creates risk for the developer. It makes it harder to put together the financial plans and backing that it takes to ultimately get to construction. And so, you know, as mentioned earlier, this is one of, I think, the key areas where we need to look at how do you improve and make more efficient the process from an overall standpoint. And, you know, we've all seen bills going through the ledge over the past couple of years to try to look at that. And so, as you mentioned, the, the yes in my backyard bill getting through, and it's, it's a first step. We need to keep pushing to try to move some of these things forward. You know, I think it's discussion sponsored around of who should look at the impact of creating housing. Is it at the county level or is it at the state level? And again, having sat in the, in the county council, I want to say it's very much a local issue. But mm -hmm. you also can't sit here and say, well, there's no statewide issue you know, in this. And so it's that balance that, you know, I don't think there's, I think what we need to realize is there isn't one right answer. And so we need to have a discussion, make a choice and find a way to make that choice be as best as possible for taking care of the considerations that need to be protected, but allowing housing to move forward. Absolutely. And, and we're glad that you guys are taking up the mantle on that. And uh, we're glad that you're pushing that conversation. Uh, you know, just with the entire state, we, we talked about Maui a little bit earlier, but, um, you know, going a little bit more in depth into that, we've found that only 5% of the land on Maui is zoned urban, uh, which is where most housing can be built, uh, obviously. What do you think needs to be changed to ensure that, that this 5% number or the, the zoning is not an impediment to building houses and that we can continue to, like you said, you know, build these in houses, increase our supply and, and get our residents and our locals housed and, and a roof over their head. Yeah, you know, it, it's a place where, as you mentioned, it's 5%, it's a low, it really feels like a low number. That said, I think as we've looked at it, there are still a good number of locations for potential housing development on Maui, even with that 5% in the area to do residential development. So. On one side, it's making sure that where you can build, you're allowed to, that can get going, and that's a regulation side we just talked about. On the other hand, you know, Maui, and I think every county needs to continue to look at where are the other places that we should be moving into housing development. You know, Oahu went through that decades ago in deciding that West Oahu was gonna be a place that would move from agricultural to residential development. Um, we know it's never easy and, and we don't want that called urban sprawl going everywhere, but we also can't hold back the need for housing um, by artificially you know, not being willing to have those discussions, make some of those changes um, and, and finding the right places to open up for, for housing development. And, you know, key part of that is I'll go back to our, our House Maui initiative. The first pillar of House Maui is aligning resources. and one of the main areas that we talk about there is government taking on the infrastructure responsibility for housing. And so what we had started to see over the past probably 10 to 15 years was that the infrastructure costs, offsite infrastructure costs, meaning regional roads, sewer um, lines, and those types of things were falling on the development. And that was causing housing costs to continue to go up, or again, as we mentioned earlier, not happen at all. We've seen some success where the government at the county, state, federal level is willing to put in the money for infrastructure development, sewer lines, sewer plants, roadways, taking that burden off of the development. We're actually on Maui seeing a development that has increased the number of affordable housing units that will be built because the county and state are willing to build a road extension that was originally falling on the developer's cost. And so, that's the way that as you open up new lands to the potential for homes, you need to bring in um, the development or the infrastructure development. So uh, one other note, another great example of that is Kaka'ako on Oahu. You know, the, the developments that are happening there with Kamehameha Schools and Ward Village are because the state through HCDA put in the infrastructure into that area that's allowing those things to happen. It took longer than perhaps desired, but it's allowing homes to be built. 
Wow, that's very interesting. And now, obviously, with a uh, with the public sector, you know, doing the infrastructure and, and things like that, taking it from the developer, do you see any sort of, of additional time, maybe that that uh, takes to to the add to the project? For example, if they need to expand the sewer lines, um, would it take longer for the the public sector to do it than the developer? It depends on the situation, right? And so yes, the goal is to get that public sector infrastructure work happening ahead of the curve. And that's sure. why as we talk about opening up new lands for potential residential development, you have that opportunity to stay ahead of the game. When you're doing you know, what we'll call infill areas, you know, places that are really already designated, there's already roads and sewers around, but need improvements, while it can sometimes take the public sector longer to do that, you know, the, the resource magnitude that the public sector can bring is significant enough to change the affordable housing counts in a way that it, it may be worth some of that time. Again, sure. we're, and that's sort of the worst case is if it takes longer. But, you know, we've seen on Maui, because this hasn't existed, this effort hasn't existed, developers are putting in their own water systems because the county isn't ready to provide it and wastewater as well. We're trying sure. to be a be a part of getting that county side running a little bit faster in order to keep up with the development and again take these costs off of the developer and therefore allow them to build homes at a cheaper cost and therefore sell them at a cheaper cost right understandable well let's let's kind of talk more uh, laser focused on maui here for a second uh recently the the state commission on water resource a water resource management recently designated West Maui as a surface water and groundwater management area. Uh, for the viewers at home, you know, could you help explain what this decision means and, and what really is going to be the fallout for home builders, if any? Yeah, yeah this is a really interesting one for us um, in that, so what it does, it, it puts a state uh, entity as an additional regulatory process and permit is required before development can basically get approval for its water to move forward. Um, and so when you put on a pure housing lens, it sounds really scary. But you know, we are working on another initiative that we work on at the White Treaty Foundation is the Fresh Water Initiative. And that's really starts to get into how do we recharge the water system? How do we make sure that fresh water is available down the road? Upside is we're not seeing a situation where there's a lack of fresh water, but obviously the long-term plan to management of that is important. And so theoretically what this overlay does with um, CWARM, right, the, the Commission on Water Resource, uh, it helps plan and protect for the long-term water use. And so as you balance those two things together, it's one of those areas where we can recognize there's a need for fresh water management, no question. This regulatory additional overlay is risky, right? And so let's just go back to what I said earlier. It's not that regulation is bad, but we need to make sure that it runs efficiently, takes care of what needs to be protected, but allows housing to move forward at a reasonable rate. And you know, one of the things as we're going through that is that recognition that a large part of Oahu is all covered by a similar overlay and from, from Seaworm. And, as was said in, in some of the hearings, it hasn't stopped development. So what does, you know, back to your question, what does this mean for housing? Yes, it means there's an extra step. What it means for, for us, sort of the broader us right now is we need to work with the commission going forward to make sure that that, if, that system is efficient, that there, we get them information ahead of time about what's going on about the various impacts. So that when those permit applications in, they have what they need, to review the situation and make decisions quickly, but also they'll be able to ahead of time let potential developers and landowners know where there are issues. And if we can do that efficiently together, it's a regulation that can work okay from a housing perspective. And as, as we recognize it, it's balancing two very, very important factors for our community. Sure. Well, you know, staying in Maui, Today, the council is, I believe, considering uh, Bill 107 that would effectively set the, the price of affordable homes 20 to 25 percent lower than the affordable prices currently. 
Uh, could you go through and, and let us know what kind of what are the pros and cons to this policy as well? I mean, we've seen you, you mentioned about the sea worm and, and West Maui earlier, but uh, it seems like there's a lot going on in Maui in terms of housing. Yeah, it is. And I was actually over there on Friday and testified before the council on this bill. Um, yeah, the upside and, and got to give them recognition is that the council has taken on this issue and has moved a number of bills through the council. Have to admit, we don't, haven't agreed with all of them, but the fact that it's being looked at and being worked on is, is a great credit to the council. So this bill, you know, it's one of the, on its surface, it sounds great, right? The bottom line is it's looking to lower the price of affordable homes, what they can be sold to, to, to Maui residents. Um, but as you pointed out, it, puts, it creates a calculation that drops the price by say 25%. And the reality is nobody can build a home for that price. And therefore on its face, no development of affordable homes is gonna happen because you're gonna to have to sell it for less than you can build it for. So if that were the whole picture, that'd be a problem. As again, we've been working with the council and the county on these things. The council wants to provide subsidies to make up that difference in cost. So developers can still develop, make, make the profit that they need to and sell the homes at a lower price. Obviously that starts to get complex in how that works within the overall system, how you give the developer enough assurance that that subsidy is going to be there that allows them to move forward with their development at a point where they're having to put in hundreds of thousands of dollars into pre-development work. And so that's what, at least I testified, when I testified last week, tried to talk to with the council and say, let's take the next couple of weeks as it moves from first reading to second reading, to talk about where the solutions are mechanically and process wise to make sure that this will work. The upside is we're all working for the same goal, which is to provide Maui residents who need affordable housing homes that they can afford. Uh, we just want to make sure that as these policies are created and the county has a, a good level of subsidy money available, that it can be done in the best way. It's back to being most efficient, most effective, not creating risk, unintended consequences for the results. So I'm sort of looking forward to the next couple of weeks to diving into that with hopes that we can get some real good solution. Absolutely. And, and just to kind of piggyback on that, I, you had mentioned subsidies and, and earlier in the program, you had mentioned about the county uh, working on infrastructure and helping the developer out there. Do you think that there's... Uh, you know, any kind of issue with, uh, you know, paying for the infrastructure? Is there enough money, I guess, really, to pay for all of the infrastructure needs, you know, the roads, the sewage, all of this, in addition to handing out a subsidy to a uh, developer? You know, the upside, and yeah, this comes a bit from having that on the council here in Honolulu for six years, is those two things, grants for making homes affordable or grants to individuals, and then the infrastructure are two different parts of the budget, right? The, so the infrastructure side comes from the CIP budget, which allows the county to borrow money and pay that back long term. And that can allow the county to have much more um, resources available for that effort. On the other side, so more from the operating budget side, right? And this is where the real property tax and really feeds that side of the budget. Um, the county has dedicated a, a decent chunk of that for these types of subsidy programs. So there is very much the opportunity for both of those engines to be working at the same time and have significant resources for it. And again, that's where we're trying to come in and, and help play or at least talk through some of that role it, because there's a lot of different players that get, get involved and figure out how to best use those funds. The last thing I'll add on that is when you think about that infrastructure side, it's not just the county bonding side uh, for, for CIP of capital improvement projects, but right now you've got some state monies as well as the federal infrastructure bill. So as the counties and states start to understand a little bit more about how those federal resources can be used, we think they can be put into infrastructure work for affordable housing that can be so it's, just, so it's one of these unique situations coming out of COVID, given the federal legislation. We want to make sure we're ready to take advantage of as the state of Hawaii and all the individual counties. Sure. Now, now we're 
reaching the end of our program here. So I, I wanted to give you, Todd, a, an opportunity. You had mentioned that, that you didn't agree with Maui County Council on, on everything that they're doing to address housing. Is there anything that, that you guys specifically, any reforms specifically that, that you guys are focusing on, on Maui or, or any of the other islands that you want to just uh, briefly touch on? Yeah, I think the thing I'd want to touch on is less about the specific solution right now, but the point being that it's really going to take collective action by everyone. And it's not just the policymakers and those of us that may normally be involved in showing up at council hearings or having those discussions. Everyone in the community needs is going to need to play a part because there's there's tough decisions out there that need to be made, right? We talked about it, whether it's changing regulatory processes, figuring out how to involve the community voice in a way that's reasonable, that takes into account the various sides of the consideration, but ultimately get to decisions so that housing can be built in the right way. And so it goes to really our the third pillar of our, our initiative around organize and engage. You know, we want to make everyone in the community know that they need to be willing to, to voice their opinion. Um, and what we realize we need to do is to help get out the information to educate around how we can get to affordable housing solutions. You know, it's always something we've always seen. It's always easy to fight something and say no to something. It takes a lot of work to support something in the right way and get it to the right decision. And our policymakers need to be supported in that effort. Um, and so that's really where I'm thinking our efforts going to be over the next probably 12 to 18 months is developing that platform and system so that people can get organized, get engaged, advocate as a community for affordable housing and hopefully bring along these solutions. Um, and again, we're starting in the Maui County, but they're needed across the state. So just looking forward to continuing that effort and and seeing the results. And last thing I'll say, because development work is not quick, right? So that if not Amazon, it doesn't show up in three days. Um, it's gonna, it, it's take, it'll take some time to see the results and people also need to be willing to stick in with that um, and keep working till we get to those results. Sure, well, Todd, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today and for the work that, that you guys are doing when it comes to housing on Maui. Uh, of course, we want to thank the audience for joining us for another episode of Hawaii Together. I'm Ted Kafalis, standing in for Dr. Kaili'i Akina. Until next time, aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.